<clears throat> Thank you. Nice to meet you. Okay, I'm here with Javen Troth. Hey, Javen. Hey, Tristan. How you doing? Good. Thanks so much for joining me for a chat. I'm really excited about this. Um, so, thanks for having me. No, a pleasure. So um, to kick things off, we're going to go with some quick fire questions for you. Um, we've done these in the past on the podcast, but they tended to be at the tail end of the episode. And they've always been the same question for every single guest. And those questions sort of tended to revolve around cocktails and desert island bars and that kind of thing. But we're shaking it up a little bit and you are the test subject for this. Okay. We've yeah. never done it before like this. Yeah. Um, so I hope you're ready. So it's a quick fire round. The idea is you just give one word answers, which does make it tricky. And it means you've got to think on your feet. Um, cause some of the questions are a little bit left field, but, uh, let's give it a try okay. and see how you get on. The idea though, <laughs> is it's a sort of rapid introduction to you. Um, purely based on the thoughts that come into your mind when probed with certain questions. <laughs> I think that, I think the biggest challenge you're going to have is one word answers for me, but that's okay. We can give it a shot. Well, there's plenty of time for longer answers in the rest of the episode. So <laughs> try and save that for then. Sounds good. Right. Here we go. Quick fire questions. Shaken or stirred? Shaken. Plant milk or real milk? Real milk. Vodka martini or gin martini? <laughs> gin all day. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Mexican Would you rather Coke. cuddle with a baby panda or a baby penguin? Panda. Nice. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Instagram or TikTok? Instagram. Yeah, I thought you'd go with that. Friday night or Saturday night? Ask permission or beg forgiveness? Permission. Nice. You're a good boy. <laughs> Do you snore? Yes. <laughs> Have you ever worn socks with sandals? No. <laughs> Scale of one to 10. How good are you at flair bartending? Zero. <laughs> Making drinks or tasting drinks? Tasting drinks. Do you like chartreuse? Yes. What sound do you make when a drink is really tasty? Oh. Give me a cocktail name beginning with the letter Q. You can make it up if you have to. Uh, that's, that's a devastating question yet. <laughs> Um, just make it up. Just make it up. Uh, quietly delicious. Ooh, I like it. Sounds tasty. Uh, how long can you hold your breath for? A minute. Dark chocolate or milk chocolate? Milk. What's the most boring cocktail ever? Vodka, anything. <laughs> All right, we're done. <laughs> um, that was fun. It's... So you want, you want some feedback? Go on then. You want some feedback? Two, two hardest questions. The one, the cocktail with Q, and Friday or Saturday for some reason. I was like, yeah. I, had a, I had a double clutch on that one. I know, right? Because we've all had good Friday nights and good Saturday nights. It's really hard to kind of pick one right. over the other. Yeah. Something a bit more naughty about a Friday night, I think, because you've been working during the day. It feels like a bonus <laughs> night in a way, whereas Saturday, a bit more planning involved, you know, and eh. they've both got good features and benefits. Um, but anyway, yeah the, yeah, the cocktail beginning with Q is a tough one. I, I can't think of any myself, like classic cocktails beginning with Q. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm horrible at coming up with names for cocktails. So that was a uh, double, double whammy. But that's okay. <laughs> so, so am I as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Right. Well, let's get into the more long form questions now. Um, so license to distill, um, we've already mentioned it in the introduction, but 1.1 million followers on Instagram, I believe. And a, I mean, if anyone's not checked it out, I'm, I'm sure most pretty much anyone listening to this podcast has come across it at some point. Um, you should go check it out. Um, just a brilliant, I think, sort of varied resource on 
um, cocktail culture, bar culture, some of it funny, some of it serious, some of it um, educational, engaging. It's, it's, it's really cool. Um, how did it, how did it all begin? Yeah, that's uh, thank you, by the way, for those comments about it. We, um, so about 11 years ago, my wife and I had our first real cocktail experience, I would say, um, reluctantly didn't really know what we were in for a friend of ours made a, an, an appointment for us or a reservation for us at a, at a bar that he was, like, you have to go visit this place. And, um, we did after a concert one night, it was late. We were kind of over it, walked in. It was just like life-changing to be honest with you. So we just really fell in love with the, the whole thing, the, the drinks, the experience, uh, the people there, just everything that happened that night, just lit a fire um, mm. for us. So we, you know, after we kind of came back home from that trip and, and, um, just started kind of diving into, you know, making cocktails at home and, and finding other places to go like that, which where we were living, um, uh, was a challenge actually. So it was kind of like a quest, you know, and we'd start seeking places out as we travel, looking for, you know, similar experiences. And so fast forward from there about five years and the industry that I was in, um, was kind of a, a falling knife. It wasn't really doing well. And I thought, you know, I need to figure some things out on social media just to have that in my, in my back pocket. I was in sales and marketing and I, I wasn't, on social media at the time, um, wasn't really a fan of it. So one day I asked, I asked my wife, Hey, can you, can you start an Instagram account for me? I want to try to <clears throat> excuse me, figure this out a little bit. And, um, we started about cocktails, started licensed to distill just as a hobby. We started posting some stuff on there that places that we wanted to go, places that we did go, little cocktail parties that we threw, just, you know, things that we were into really. And, um, it just took off immediately. And a few, a few months later the the company that I was working for shut down. So like I guess that industry was already, you know, on its way down and they just pulled the plug. So after being there for I don't know, 12, 15 years, it was, you know, came home with a box of stuff and said, I'm don't have a job and just dove into license to still to see if there, we can make something of it, you know, um, to do it on a full-time basis. And that's really where it started just as a platform for bartenders and bars and brands that we loved that we just wanted to, to share with everybody. How do you make that leap from, you know, what most of us would consider a, like a, a kind of recreational <clears throat> social media account that, you know, is almost serves as like a public diary of what we're up to, to right now, this needs to pay my bills, you know, that's, uh, that's, I wish I, I wish I could tell you that, you know, I had it all mapped out, I, but we didn't. Um, there were some things that, that happened along the way that just from, you know, basically putting out as much hard work as possible and seeing like what came back. And, and even within the few months, cause I basically had a few months of, I don't know you call it severance or whatever from, from the company to play with. Thank goodness. Because if I didn't, I probably would yeah. be still back in that industry, like on the wheel, you know? Um, just out of necessity, but I had a few months to play with and that's, you know, tell my wife, Hey, I want to see what I can do with this. And we got down to the, you know, we got down to the wire. Um, that last check from my severance, you know, came right before I got my first real break in the industry and keep in mind, no, no industry experience. So it's not like I knew who to call. Nobody knew who we were, you know, they're looking at the page on social and, they don't, they, you know, we're not an industry, you know, person. So they don't really know how to, how to take us. And we exploded to the point where I think some people were just like, what, who is this? What, what just happened here? You know? Um, so it changed even within the few months before things kind of, we, we got the break that we needed to make this a, a real job. Um, at first I was like, maybe I'll create content. Brands started reaching out. A few brands started reaching out for us to, you know, create content, being a typical influencer, I guess you'd say. And so we started doing some informal videos at home and that process was tough at first and dealing with agencies that, you know, weren't really clear on what the client wanted and all of that back and forth for the amount of money. I realized really quickly that 
it, that was not going to be a full-time gig for me. That was going to, you know, replace what my, my, my income and give us what we need. So what I, what I started to focus in on was maybe I could do social for brands. Cause what, what we saw was licensing that still had exploded to the point where it was larger really quickly than most of the heritage brands that I was you know, shocked. I'm going, how am I bigger than that brand or that brand already? Now I know why after being in the industry for a little bit, but at the time and being kind of, you know, new to this and some of the constraints that some of the brands face on their social channels, I was like, maybe I can just do this for brands. So I started peppering DMs, you know, not even knowing that most of these DMs don't even go to the brand. They go to a, an agency themselves mm. who would have buried my message. <laughs> <I> <laughs> <guess> I was <laughs> competition. I didn't even know it. But um, one of the brands that I was a huge fan of was Whistlepig Whiskey. And um, I reached out to them and I started doing some things, you know, to show them what I could do just on the peripheral that they that got their attention. And that led to a conversation with their CMO who had just come on and kind of had a new vision for their marketing as well. And they, they flew me out to tails and I created a deck and <laughs> I'd never created a deck before, let alone one for this industry. <laughs> I put what I thought, you know, brands should be doing. We sat in a hotel, you know, at tails which I'd never even heard of before. When they asked me about Tales of Cocktail, I'm like, <laughs> I'm sitting on the phone going, what is, what is Tales? I'm like Googling it as I'm talking to them. But um, they said, hey, let's, let's, let's do this. Let, let, we want to hire you. And that literally was the, was the spark that allowed us to now focus in on this. Um, my focus became their, their social media, but licenses still continue to grow. And then it kind of, you know, changed again where, it shifted from us doing social media for brands to now we're creating content for brands and doing some consulting on social media. But I was, I was literally running their social for two years on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, posting content, creating content, influencer programs, all of that stuff for them. That's just, that's, that's where I thought the, the model was going to be. Um, but again, the shift, you know, continues as licenses still got bigger. We had to, we had to morph that into what, more of what it is now. Mm. So what what would you describe it as now? Would you sort of describe it as a well? In fact, you describe it. I'm, I'm, I can probably make an attempt at it, but uh, yeah. you're going to know better than me. No, no. Um, so y you have, I think, from a um, from the consumer perspective, or from you know follower perspective, there's what you see on the page, which is kind of like the forward facing, which is the content that we either create or curate which has always been an element of licensing still from the start mm. um, was sharing content from other bars, other bartenders that we thought was cool, you know, and not just having it be our own perspective and limited to where, where we can be physically. That was always a big part of, of the um, idea, you know, behind it. But also there's what you don't see, which is again, consulting, you know, um, helping brands kind of craft their social strategy, um, working with them on ad management, you know, digital ad spends, and some of those things that you would never see on the content side, mm -hmm. because um, it's all happening, you know, behind the scenes. So th and that's just playing into some of the strengths that that myself and, and Jeremy, who works with me, um, you know, some of the strengths that we have as far as doing social for brands and taking that experience and helping brand, not just we'll create the content for you, but how can you create your own content that works well on social. Mm. So you, you are sort of, you are sort of still functioning as um, a social media marketing agency for some brands, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they tap into us for other things. I mean, our, our main focus is, um, is creating content for the, yeah. you know, for the most part, but so much of that, you know, we, we don't tend to do like one-offs very often with brands. We tend to mm. get involved with them and do programs, you know, month over year, month, year over year. And because of that, there's a lot of discussion about messaging, content creation, that kind of thing. And so it, we find there's a lot of overlap anyway, whether you want to call it like official consulting or just a matter of like, when we get on the phone with them, we get in, in meetings with them. It's like, here's what's working, you know, and here's what we're seeing and here's, Here's how we create content. Can we help you create content similar to that? That has nothing to do with us. It's going to be for your own channels, but that will work well on social. 
Yeah. So yeah, we still do that. I don't think we're a traditional agency by any means. Mm. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit um, different. But especially during the Yeah. But especially during the pandemic, I mean, there were times that we couldn't do our typical content creation. So we had to do some of these other things just to keep, you know, keep the lights on. Yeah. Yeah. So so what does make good content? I mean, without giving away all of your secrets so that you no longer have any brand partners to work with because they now know everything. Um, what do you, and, it, and obviously no, no, I realize and, it's a very broad that's... question and, it, and it's brand specific, but give us yeah. some, perhaps some examples of great content that you've made. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's a, there's a couple of different things to keep in mind when it comes to, to content. Because if you go on License to Distill, you'd probably be shocked to see how much of that is actually content that we are you know partnering with a brand and how much is just stuff that we like to post because mm -hmm. we enjoy the content or we want to give some love to to someone that um that we enjoy and so the ratio is actually there's far more unbranded content <laughs> than there is branded content on there and but that gives us a good indication of what's working and what's not but i, I think the difficult thing always for content creators is good content versus content that works well on social. And sometimes those things are two different things and it can be maddening at times, but we can go and we can create our, you know, best shoot we've ever done. You know, just these phenomenal shoots, the best equipment, you know, the best lighting, the best bartender, all these things. And we can, and, and Instagram won't show it to very many people. And yeah. then we can, you know, have a cell phone video with, you know, horrible noise and shaky, you know, <laughs> shaky framing, all that stuff. And the thing will absolutely crush. Yeah. And so, you know, what do you consider the best content I, for us? We want to be proud of the content that we make. Um, and just understand that we're, you know, kind of, we're boxed in a little bit by algorithms and other things. And so some of our favorite content, you know, we did, we did something this last year, for um, Bar Hill Gin, who's like really, you know, beekeeping and, and honey is all a part of their, of their brand story. So we took some bartenders and we took them to an apiary and we had did a full on experience where they not only got some education, but they actually got suited up. We all got suited up in the full on beekeeping, you know, outfit and went into the hives, harvested their own honey you know, pulled the, pulled the hives out, interacted with the bees, learned about the bees, harvested their own honey, and then took that honey and made cocktails. Um, nice. And it was absolutely phenomenal. But again, is that our most successful content on social? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I was at, I was at um, a bar and nightclub show in Vegas last year and took out my cell phone, this you know, this device that's, that, that a brand was releasing that smoked cocktails. They said, hey, you should take a video of this, take a video of it, posted it to Instagram and to YouTube. And on YouTube, that thing has like 35 million views. Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it just, it, it is what it is. It's so crazy. there's the, like I said, there's the content that we love to make. Yeah. And then there's the content that works. And sometimes those things, you know, the home run is when those things intersect. Yeah, I get you. I mean, you're, you're obviously right about the fact that you can make beautiful content. And for some reason, it doesn't translate that well onto a smartphone screen or whatever. Whereas yeah. <clears throat> on the flip side of that, you, you mean, just look at memes, right? They tend to be like the most sort of basic put together um, GIFs or, or images, you know, where it's like mm -hmm. Leonardo DiCaprio's face and some like dodgy looking text or something. And that's it. And yeah, they go, yeah, you know, millions and millions of people see them. They get spread far and wide. And it's because it's almost because they're so bad that it makes it immediately shareable. You're not trying to kind of prove a point like here's some great content, share this. It's like, look at this silly thing, but you get what you get the message. You understand what it means and you have a laugh, you share it, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what, that's why I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that's really important is looking at the analytics mm. and not just looking at likes. You know, we talk, talk to bartenders a lot that, you know, a lot of this is very personal. You know, you create something. I, I even have that with like one of the videographers that we use. You know, I can tell there's times where he'll put a lot of work, we'll put a lot of work into a shoot and, you know, he's editing and that's a, that's a labor of love. 
you know, and then, then you post it and it's like, wah, wah, you know, just, mm-hmm. and, and it, I feel bad. And, and sometimes we can look at that as a reflection of the work, but it's not because at the end of the day, when you look at the analytics, um, yeah, that might, that thing might have a lower number of likes than maybe other content, but look at how many people Instagram has shown it to, you know, I mean, the, it's one of, like I said, it's one of the maddening things that comes with social media, the algorithms and all that stuff. But within a minute or two of posting a video, I can look at the analytics and I can tell you exactly what it's going to do. Mm. Because it, it, especially on Instagram, YouTube's a little bit different story because it tends to have a longer arc, you know, in terms of view. Sometimes things can take off months after you post it. But on Instagram, you've got a very short window, you know, 24, 48 hours for that thing to run out. And it's very rare that something starts off really slow and then gains a bunch of momentum later. You usually know pretty quickly. And that means they're making that decision early on. And it's not somebody watching it and going, oh, wow, this is fascinating. Let me make sure that this gets out to, this is like a, you know, a computer algorithm that's making a decision on the spot. Yeah. And that, that algorithm, that algorithm um, really decides how many people see it. And the more people that see it, the more people are going to like it. It's just, you know, it's a lot of averages. So you can get a ton of likes, but it's because hundreds of thousands of people saw it. Does that mean that it was better content than something that you got that has a thousand likes? Mm. No, it just might mean that, you know, 5,000 people saw it. But when you start looking at the percentages, you know, you realize that like, oh, so many people that, you know, an X amount of people that, that saw this liked it. And over here, a huge amount of people saw it. And maybe the percentage is lower of people that actually mm. like the content. They swiped past it, but the total number looks big because you know, Instagram showed it to more people. Yeah. And then there's also the people that's showing it too as well. Right. you know, who, who the audience is. I mean, I yeah. guess you do want to spread it far and wide. So what's, so what's the secret source then? Like if you know, if you're on it with um, the analytics and you understand how a video is going to turn out over the next 48 hours based on the first few minutes, Surely you have some idea now then of what makes for what you know what what's sort of triggering the algorithm to do do what you want it to do. Is it video length? Is it you know how many you know cut scenes there are in it or text placement or what you know what does it? You know, I I, I have I don't think we have enough data to get like that far in the weeds about like specific lengths and and those types of things. I do think that one of the things that we try to um, always do is is follow the lead of what the the social media platforms are are promoting and what they're on you know there for a while like we'll just take instagram for example for a while instagram was trying to compete with youtube with like longer form content with igtv you posted videos over a minute long it triggered it to igtv and they tended to do a lot better so we started creating content we knew that okay instagram is pushing this new toy so we started you know keeping that in mind when we were doing our makes sense videos and our editing but then now igtv is an afterthought it's like basically it's all one type of feed post and reels you know the tiktok uh competitor is now their new toy so like you said using text overlays and 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 filming natively in the app instead of like filming a video on your phone and then posting it we, we found that a lot of times instagram can't even handle the the, um, the quality of the video filmed with like a normal, you know, iPhone or whatever. And so they're like changing the color ratio and, mm. and the, the quality gets tweaked, but then you film it in the app, which is what they want you to do. And it does a lot better. You know? Don't leave the so app. Yeah, they're like, we will reward you. Just yeah. don't leave the app. <laughs> exactly. They, they want us, you know, editing, adding music, text overlay in their platform. And so, I think for us, and same thing with, with YouTube, YouTube started doing YouTube shorts, obviously to compete with the TikToks and Instagrams. And we found our content has exploded on YouTube because of YouTube shorts. When, when you find out, or when you realize that they've got a new toy, you got to You got to think about, you know, not to like completely do a departure from like, you know, your soul yeah. as far as content creation, but you need to think about how your content can work with those things so that you can play the game a little bit and have better success at letting people discover you and, and them getting the content out and not just stay in the same rep. I, you know, 
one of the difficult things for this industry because photography has been such a huge part of it. You know, this cocktail photography page is all over. But the CEO of Instagram a few months ago said, Instagram is basically no longer going to be a photography, it's video. We're not, we're not a photography platform. That's a, that's, you know, a signal to all content creators that it's not that, you know, you can't post photos anymore. Of course you can, but what is Instagram's focus? What are they going to be putting in front of people? It's video. Yeah. So instead of just, you know, creating that cocktail, putting it on the bar and taking a photo, take a short video of it, make it real, put it out there like that, you know? Makes perfect sense. And as a content creator, you got to think, right, if Instagram are now going to be putting videos in front of everyone, you know, you can get, you can be the first in line. If you start putting out lots of video, they're going to need the content from somewhere, right? They need that user content. So if you're there doing it, then, um, you can capitalize on that early. And not only are you sort of one of the first creators, but all the, all the people who are just viewing have no other option. You know, they're getting it put in front of them because that's what Instagram want them to see. Absolutely. And that, that's a key. And that's what we're seeing like on the YouTube front, because I mean, YouTube has been around forever, but when they started doing shorts, they were hungry and still are hungry for shorter form content. That's, you know, vertical full screen. That's a departure from what YouTube has tended to be, which is, you know, the widescreen longer form content. Mm. And because of that, when, when we filled that pipeline, um, it, that, that content exploded and our YouTube exploded too. I mean, we, we weren't even giving any attention to YouTube. And we got like, I think we're up to 80 something thousand subscribers in a year. Just, I mean, and it's literally prime, you know, I shouldn't say it's all from, but I'd say 99% of that is from shorts, but we've mm-hmm. been able to capitalize on it because we happen to have content <laughs> that is in that minute or less range. And we have a bank of it. And when we post it, it's like, we're feeding the the beast that that YouTube wants to you know get this content out there and and, and show off their new toy. So I'm not so, familiar with YouTube yeah, Shorts. Is is it is basically like designed for the mobile phone that and it's a vertical video and shorter? Is that is that yeah. the kind of gist of it? Yeah, you can still see it. You know, you can still see it on other devices, but when you look at it, it's very much like Reels. It's very much like TikTok. Yeah. It's full screen vertical, minute or less. Add music. Add text overlay. It's there. Look, it's their competitor too. <laughs> it's mm. everybody looking at videos that way on on their phones, right? For YouTube and tic- I mean for uh, Instagram and TikTok. So, but that subscriber base then is there for your longer form content, you know, as well. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, you know, it makes for uh, like I said, we we've now shifted some you know a big portion of our content creation, you know, ideation to thinking about YouTube now, because it's like, wow, we got a substantial amount of, of subscribers here. And we, do, we, we can, we can use it as an opportunity to do some of the content that doesn't work on YouTube or TikTok and do it for, I mean, sorry, it doesn't work on Instagram or TikTok and do it on YouTube and let yeah. these subscribers not only see our shorts, but see some longer form content. I'm, I'm always interested when I see social media accounts of like, well, a, a few hundred thousand or definitely over a million followers. I always wonder, like, how did that happen? Like, did it, did it all occur in a short period of time? Or has it been sort of pulses of like, whoa, there's a massive growth. There's another one. Give us a sort of rundown of where, you know, where the growth came. I'm, I'm guessing it's more likely yeah. sort of certain bits of content you produced that just suddenly just ramped it up. And then, you know, another one follows. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it goes, you know, it, it kind of goes in waves. And, and I, I do think that when we started Licensed and Distill, um, the, the way that Instagram's algorithm was working at the time and the way that they were suggesting content to people was a little bit different. And um, when you really, you know, found something that, that ended up being viral in nature, you saw explosive growth, you know, in, in terms of follower accounts. But I would say probably in the first three or four months, we were at 60, 70 K um, wow. you know, or maybe butting up to about a hundred K within a few months. And that's why I said, you know, I'm looking at, at brands and going, wait a minute, <laughs> how are you at you know, 20,000 followers after all this time? And, 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 and so that's what kind of sparked the idea of like, maybe we figure something out here that brands can, you know, can tap into. 
but then um we i, I want to say we got to about 275 or so when we were uh, working with whistlepig and definitely our focus and our shift became making sure that that was because you know we had no industry experience no one knew who we were we wanted to make sure that 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 was going to be a calling card that that really worked well and so our shift really you know w went to developing their page and we started a brand new page for them from scratch uh, we you know basically blew up there i think they had like fifteen thousand followers or so when, when i started and i told them hey let's scrap that thing and let's start this right from the start mm. and um in in two years it was the second or the third largest whiskey page in the world on instagram wow um, so we, we crushed it but that plateaued a little bit license to the stills growth and we were kind of in that 275 range for a while but then you know then it, it ramped up again and you're right certain pieces of content would would show like you know massive growth over a few days but like i said on instagram after a couple of days that that levels off and there's got to be another piece of content and another so it was a steady growth from there um to the point that we got to where we're at now i mean we're it probably took another two years i'd say to get from 275 to 1.1 and then it's you know we're, we're in another level off period and and it's it's frustrating but one of one of the tough things is when every time we post you know every day we lose followers too just like yeah yeah else. but you can yeah. imagine how magnified it is you know, when, when someone with 10K followers is losing a certain amount of people, you know, that, that fall off or decide that, you know, they don't want to follow you, whatever. That's, that's one of the tough things. So you get suggested to somebody with a piece of content, right, on the Explorer page or suggested reel or in your feed. It says, like, you might like this. They look at that one piece of content. They go, oh, that's cool. They follow it. But there's no telling what's going to happen the rest of the week as you're posting content that may not be exactly like you that piece of content and they might be like why am i following this page again i didn't think i was doing like you know cocktail tutorials i thought i was you know doing some sort of like like you said like a meme or something else yeah and so they drop off so you you have this this constant you know ebb and flow and it's magnified at 1.1 where we have to gain a lot of followers each day just to maintain mm. and sometimes it does sometimes it dips Sometimes it picks back up and it's, it's harder to grow the larger you get. Like I could probably start a cocktail page tomorrow and be at a hundred K within a few months, not a problem. But then to go from that to anywhere close to where we're at now would be a beast. Yeah. You know, it would be, it'd be a full-time job. So it's, it's just one of the tough things that, that comes along with, with uh, Instagram. They favor smaller accounts. And smaller accounts they? grow a lot faster than the larger ones. And you see it across the board. You see it with brands. You know, some of the some of our, you know, the other cocktail pages that are large in size, you know, they're they're not having massive, massive growth. It's kind of a slow, steady climb. Uh, so yeah. so what, what do you rely on most? Is it people finding you on the Discover page or is it people sharing your content onto their stories or, or whatever? Yeah, you know, I think the Discover page is still, you know, if you can hit something that is, uh, like I said, viral in nature and Instagram's getting it out to a large number of people, that does help. Sharing to stories, I and mean, that does help, but, you know, usually the people that are sharing it don't have massive followings. Mm. Um, certainly, anytime that you can collaborate on content with people that maybe are outside of your, you know, your circle, um, that, that certainly helps. You know, we do a lot of stuff with, with, brands in the food space like Traeger and, um, you know, steak companies or knife companies and that kind of thing. Um, and, and anytime we can collaborate, we're like, they're now showing our content or talking about us to a plot on, you know, on a platform that just hasn't, they don't know about us. Yet. Yeah. It's, it's a different it's audience really, altogether, right? The, yeah. It's a different audience. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I definitely think you do reach a level of saturation that as you said, mm. the open, probably a lot of people in the industry have come across us at one whether they knew who we were or anything like that, that's a whole different story. I don't think very many people know us yet, but have probably come across our content. Yeah. But when you can get to a whole nother segment, like something as big as food, then you can see that collaboration really helps you ramp up in a different yeah. way. The so, other thing about um, the other yeah, thing, that's, sorry, go on, go on. Sorry. No, no, that was it. 
Yeah. Uh, the other thing I was going to say about um, when you're losing followers, it must be it's virtually impossible to get one back, isn't it? So although you know you've got all these potential people who might follow you out there, all the ones who've unfollowed you are now sort of crossed off the list. Like, well, well that's a person that we're never getting back. And because that number's increasing every single day, <laughs> that, you know, that yeah, you've got a I constantly mean, increasing number huge. of people who are never going to yeah. follow you <laughs> again. Well, yeah. And I think there's probably some people that, that, that come back and forth. I know there's some brands that like have unfollowed them and, you know, come back and said, Oh, I don't know why I did, well, I'm not following them. Oh, you're more forgiving than me, me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't run them off completely, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, but, the, but then there's also the other thing of, you know, there's, there's a growing number of people who are being introduced and that's, that's really where the whole beauty of, of licensing is still what excites us the most from day one to now is introducing this to a new audience. And I think, I think as a, as an industry at times, we can become too consumed with talking to our own, talking to ourselves. And, you know, you and I could sit on this, po this podcast and we could nerd out on certain things that for 99% of the people, they have no idea what we're talking about in terms of cocktails. And if they were listening to it, they wouldn't be interested in it and they wouldn't feel included in the conversation. And I think one of our goals is to like, yeah, let's, let's talk about, because I, I'm, a, I'm a cocktail nerd, you know, as a consumer and a lot of people that we feature are this is their life, you know? And so they're very serious about it. Let's share that. That's fine. But let's also share some of the things that will bring people in. And, and that's something that we're always focused in on is how can, you know, markets that, you know, people, this isn't, they, they don't have <laughs> bars like the ones we feature, you know, in their area, but they're like, when I travel, I'm going to one of those spots because mm. it's like a, like a bucket list travel thing, you know, I, I want to get there. I want to check that place out. I want to, be in front of that bartender. Let's and, and that goes for certain areas of the of countries, but also it's actually certain areas of the world that you know we get messages like, you know, it's illegal to drink here. <laughs> but I'm, I follow the page because I love this and I, I want to do this. You know, I want to learn how to do this or whatever the case may be. And that's those are the areas that I think that there's a lot of room for growth that we can well, that, I, that we can still tap into. I think it's one of the things that you guys do really well is that inclusivity thing. And you, I think you do it by basically building excitement around the industry. And that excitement, sometimes it can be quite sort of geeky and in-joke sort of thing, you know, like, oh, cool, yeah, I'm a bartender. I know what he's talking about. But a lot of the time, it's just general excitement for drinks and bars. Yeah, I, that's, I mean, you know, that that's one thing that I think that we all could improve on. Mm. You know, and I, I, not to get, you know, take it back to the, our, our original bar experience, but we walked into the, to this, uh, this bar noble experiment, which is still one of my favorites down in oh, San yeah. Diego. And we, we walked in and we knew nothing, you know, my, my education on cocktails was no, I mean, no, we sat down at the, the bar and having now gone to a ton of different bars over the years, we've had some experiences that we've gone to where we were like, Oh man, that was rough. You know, they were like, we, we, know a little bit as consumers I'm, I'm certainly not a professional bartender but you walk out of there going like they made you feel like you don't know anything like either very you know a little too a little too uptight you know what i mean no, if noble experiment had been like that if we walked in there and we walked out feeling like oh man we didn't belong there th none of this none of this happens yeah we, we walked in and it was like we sat down with cross and this bartender and he's like he immediately could, you know, just a few questions could gauge where we were at. It's like, don't worry, I got you. Like, you know, let me walk you through this entire thing calmly, kindly, where we were like, this is, this is amazing. You know, we love this. And we walked out with a positive experience. That's what we need to do, I think, a better job of. And I'm, I'm, we're, I'm including us in this, but even as an industry, even on social, like, there are a lot of people that don't know. Yeah. It's okay. There's a lot of people that are making drinks the way you know you and I may view is like that's completely wrong. We can either slam them and make them feel like you don't belong here because you don't know, or we can say, "Hey, no problem. That's how you like to make your drink. Here's what you may want to consider to elevate that drink or to do it a little differently, and make them feel like they're a part of the community." And I know what it did for us, and I think it'll just serve to 
you know, improve the overall industry as a whole. And, you know, uh, in terms of the amount of people that, that become interested in drinking our drinks, you know, and, and having the experience that we're enjoying. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think the inclusivity thing is so important. And I feel like the industry went through a bit of a phase where bartenders to a certain extent, quite rightly had a chip on their shoulder about, you know, what the profession meant. And this is possibly more the case over here in the UK than the US or even other parts of Europe where it's seen as a bit more of a profession. But over here, um, you know, there was this chip on the shoulder because it was seen as like, well, you know, what are you, when are you going to get a real job? Um, <laughs> well, you just work here part time, right? What else do you do? And whilst this was going on, especially in the late nineties and noughties, the craft was really evolving and progressing very well. A lot of culinary techniques coming in, new brands, products, revival of classic cocktail culture, the whole sort of provenance movement, mm -hmm. all of this stuff coming together and bartenders, all these new bars opening as well to sort of service this movement. And, and, and we've seen the same thing with cafe culture and baristas as well. The bartender ends up taking on this sort of um, elitist position where it's like, we, you know, looks down on the customer like you have no idea how much I know about cocktails. And I'm going to either I'm going to I'm going to, you know, look down my nose at you, um, tell you exactly all the things that you don't particularly need to know so that you feel intimidated and you then have more respect for my capability as a bartender. Um, which of course is not really the best way to do things. And I think though, I think we've, we've hopefully emerged out of that period, at least in the sort of more developed cocktail cities around the world where, but where, because now people are more aware of the craft of the bartender and bartenders probably have less of a point to prove. Um, and it means they can get down to the sort of important business of, creating good experiences and good hospitality and good cocktails. Yeah. You know, and I think that that is, is really going to be a focus, um, coming out of, you know, coming out of the pandemic and getting everybody yeah. back into, into, into bars, because I think what's happened, I know what's happened, you know, the last couple of years, consumers have become much more educated. Now, is it as educated about cocktails as, as you are? Probably not. But in their minds, and in reality, they have become more educated. They've done, you know, they've killed time with online cocktail classes <laughs> and doing virtual, you know, happy hours uh, with bartenders, right? Getting those experiences. They've, they've used the opportunity um, to learn about, you know, creating their own syrups, making their own clear ice at home, you know, all these different things, right? So we can do one of two things. We can lean into that and say, that's awesome. Like, <laughs> cool. Like, yeah, you've, you've elevated what you've done at home. And now w when you sit in front of a bartender, now they can, they can lean in on that and help like enhance that, make them feel good about that and help them even elevate further. Or we can do exactly what you described and make them feel like, Oh, you still don't know as much as I do. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, don't, you're just, you're a home bartender. You know what I mean? And, and make them feel like they, that they're not welcome. Yeah. But the, the consumer has definitely uh, been educated over the yeah. last year and feels like they know more. And, and in a lot of cases they have, I mean, they, they had to try to recreate experiences at home because they couldn't have it. You know, yeah, they've had to become bartenders themselves, haven't they? Yeah. hundred percent. But the cool thing is like, even for me, you know, I didn't realize how much I missed the experience until I was back in the experience, you know, and I, I think that's, that's going to happen. We don't have anything to worry about for this industry. You know, when people leave their homes and get the experience again, and it is welcoming and it is hospitable and you have those drinks, you're like, yeah, I, I can't duplicate that one at home. Yeah that immediate feel is back and it's like, okay, it's great. When I can't go out, I can have a cool experience at home and I can still make good drinks, but I still want to be at that bar with the vibe, with the people, with the experience, with the cocktails, with the bartender. And, um, th that's, I don't think that's going anywhere. You know, no, matter no how I don't well think so. Making cocktails at home. No, I don't think so. I mean, that's, yeah. it's what makes it, it what makes, it's what makes a good bar special. I mean, all of my favorite bars in the world, 
when I think about why I want to go there, it's not really because of the drinks. Now, the drinks are, must uh, be at a certain level, obviously. You know, they can't be bad. But it's because of the bartenders, because of the music, it's because of the the decor, the, the seating, you know, the lighting, all of that kind of stuff. And, yeah, you, of course, I expect to get good drinks there, and no, no, undoubtedly do, but it's never the drinks specifically that I personally remember. It's always that general feeling and mood of being there. And, and like you say, that's, it's, well, it's, it is impossible to create in a home, I think, because the very nature of a bar is that it isn't your home. You know, it's somewhere else where you go to meet people. Right. So um, I think you're right. We need bars and, uh, and restaurants and everything need to look at it as an opportunity that they do now have a more educated consumer coming in across the board. And it's like, how do you deal with that? And I think it, it, it always comes back to that same thing. It's like, know your customer. What is it they're there for? You know, are they are they there on a date? Are they there on a business meeting? You know, is this a party or is it kind of more somber affair? What's their knowledge like? What do they drink? What you know? What can you recommend? All this kind of stuff, and then tailor it to them. And that's the you know the best bartenders in the world are the ones that don't just kind of robotically repeat the same service to every single guest. You know, they actually have some nuance in that style and can then sort of tailor it to each each guest. So we. You know, I don't want to bring up a, a a nightmare, one of our nightmare experiences, but it, it kind of speaks to like what you're what you're saying because we went to this is you know pre pandemic. We, my wife and I went to a bar. And you have to remember, you have to know, like, nobody knows. Not that anyone should know who we are. I mean, like nobody knows who we are. We go to a bar. It's not like oh, you know, somebody's here, like a food critic's here or anything like that. Just, we don't tell anyone. We just walk in like anybody else, of course. And so we show up and we go into this like this room before we get into the bar where like they stop you. And it's like literally the size of like a small elevator. And we're like, you know, in there with the hostess and she like brings up her list of rules, you know, Hey, we've got to go through the rules. And we're like, okay, you know, this is, this is like the second we walk in the place. It's like, what? <laughs> and pull out this <laughs> scroll of rules. So they go through it. Okay. Not a big deal. We sit down and um, bartender comes over and he's like, uh, okay, you know, what do you, what do you want to drink? They're going to like do bespoke cocktails, come up with something. And he asked my wife, he's like, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think of how he phrased the initial question, but I think he was like, um, you know, what do you, what do you, what, what are you looking for? Like what type of flavors are you looking for? What do you, what do you like to drink? She mentioned as she was describing the types of things that she, she likes, like, you know, not that sweet. I like bitter, I like these different things. She mentioned gin and he stops her. Because I didn't tell, I didn't ask you to tell me what spirit you like to drink. I'll decide that. I asked you <laughs> what kind of flavors you like. like <laughs> and I'm like sitting there going, are you kidding? She, and she just is like, uh, okay, I'm, so, like, I'm sorry. Like, and <laughs> He was worried he was going to be out of the job. It's like, don't design the drink yourself. That's yeah, my job. It was like, <laughs> like, bro, like, do you understand? We're not curing cancer here. We're having a cocktail. Yeah. Yeah, like, relax, yeah. you know, <laughs> and I, I do think that's one of the things that's going to, that is going to come out of, come out of this, um, as well, when things get back to it, you know, as normal as possible. I do think that just like a little bit of a, uh, let's relax, like, let's enjoy the fact that we're all back together again. And that, you know, the bar's still open, <laughs> there's customers still coming in and let's, let's just enjoy this and have some fun. And I, you can even see it on social a little bit. What I've been happy to see is that we're not, we're not taking ourselves quite as seriously as we were in some cases like you said, there's, there's, there's some pages like good cocktails and mover and shaker. They're doing a lot of humor to the industry and it's being received well. And I mm. think that before it'd be like, no, no, we gotta be so buttoned up. You know, we gotta be, this is serious. Like now people are here for an experience. They want to have a good time. They want to have good drinks. Let's not make this feel like it's too uptight and too serious. Yeah. And so I, I'm looking forward to seeing some of that go away and some more of that fun brought back to cocktails. I think it probably will. I mean, like you say, it's the, the uh, pandemic's been almost like a sort of sense check, um, reminded us of all the things we love about bars and cocktails, whether you work in the industry or you're just like drinking in these places, having had it taken away, we all sort of, you know, have been reminded of the, of the great things about it. And so even that guy you mentioned, um in the in the story in the anecdote hopefully he is back behind the stick now and thinking you know what i'm gonna be a little bit less of a 
from now on and just have fun <laughs> lighten up <laughs> yeah i mean if you yeah if you want people to if you want people to show back up right uh to your yeah, bar, exactly. yeah um yeah yeah I mean, what you know especially right now like you know as things are reopening and different th different things it may not be that, that you can go to bars at the same frequency that you did before. Maybe it's more of a special occasion right now because of different, you know, different things, whatever the case may be. What places are you going to think back and go to? It's going to be the places where it's like, I know I'm going to have a good time, have a good experience, sit across from a cool bartender. You know, I mean, we're, we're going to be received well and the drinks are going to be great. You know, if, if I, if I only have uh, so many choices or so many you know times or occasions that I yeah. can go out and do stuff because of, you know, what's going on in our area, in our area or whatever, I'm going to make sure that when I go out, it is like a uh, grand slam, you know, otherwise I, the worst thing to do is when you sit down somewhere and you're like, I could have made better drinks at home. I would have been at better time at home. I mean, it's like, why spend the money? Do, do it at your house. So it's, it's the type of places that we feel welcome and, and enjoy that we're going to be going to uh, right now as we you know get back to normal. Besides the trend then for, you know, filtering out the BS, let's say, um, and, you know, having a bit more fun, what other trends do you see occurring right now or, or perhaps looking into your crystal ball? It's that same old question, the trend question, um, that I'm sure you get asked all the time. But what do you think, what, what other things around the corner do you think? You know, I, I think that... Uh, you know, on the on the social side, I think that the trend's going to continue to have opportunities for bartenders and bars to share their story and their content in in easier ways. Um, that's something that you know I think that the the platforms and the technology is making it so you know a bar doesn't need to hire. I mean, they can, but they don't need to hire. Uh, a photographer, a videographer to come in and share their, their new menu, you know, their cocktails. It, it can, it can simply be, you know, some of our best content is from sitting across the bar from somebody. We call it like our bar, bar stool series where it's like unedited <laughs> with cell phone across from bartender. Like this, you know, our cell phones have become our video shoot. Well, they're amazing and, pieces of camera equipment um, apart from anything else, aren't they? I mean, they're just the, the rate at yeah. which the quality has advanced is just nuts in the last few years. And like we said, I mean, even like Instagram hasn't even caught up to the video quality that your phone produces. So like you don't need to come in and have somebody bring in, you know, all this equipment. You know, obviously you want to have, you know, good lighting and you want to, you want to figure that stuff out. But I, I think that um, we are set up for you know, opportunities for bartenders to um, really showcase what they're working on globally and share, share it with the global audience and bring more attention to themselves, to their platform, to their personal brand, obviously the bar that they're working with as well. Um, because before, you know, I think it was like, a, you know, partly a time thing, you know, bartender, it's just like the last thing they want to do is after they, you know, make a cocktail. Like now I got to, now we got to shoot it. But it's simple. It's simple to pull out your phone, take a little video of it, throw some music on it right there in the app, post it. Right. Um, and same thing for, for an actual bar, like got a new cocktail menu, show it in real time, show it, show it raw, show the bartender making it with someone sitting with a, you know, a, a cell phone across from you. Even if you want to, like, if you want to get really fancy, buy a gimbal for a hundred bucks that fits mm. your cell phone and you'll have completely steady shots, you know, and, and it won't, you know, it feels very professional in terms of the way it looks. Um, but I, I just, I, I think that, and that's one of the things that we try to do with, with um, some remote shooting that we're doing, like with GoPro, where even, even if you just want to elevate it to like a GoPro and you want to get some POV, those, you can bring those things to life with very simple editing tools, not a lot of time and show what you're doing in a way that's very unique, that doesn't have to be a time waster, doesn't have to be super polished, doesn't have to cost a lot of money. You know, um, even a GoPro from a couple of years ago, a couple of versions ago is plenty um, for, an, for an Instagram or TikTok video or YouTube video. I, um, I, use, so, um, yeah. I, I use GoPro uh, for running. So I do like 
POV running because I do a lot of trail running. Those things are oh, cool. incredible. Like it's the size of a match. They're amazing. And it has, yeah. you don't even need a gimbal. It's got like onboard video stabilization, no. like software stabilization. So you can bounce the thing around. And then yeah. when it comes to edit, you're like, okay, it's just perfectly smooth. And um, they're virtually indestructible yeah. as well. And like you say, <clears throat> you get, you know, all the video editing software thrown in for free as well. So you can do it all. Um, yeah. they're, they're amazing devices. It's simple. Yeah. It, and I think that taking, you know, opportunities like that where technology, you know, is making it simpler for us and easier for us. And then just, yeah, you know, sometimes we'll just tell bartenders, like, get, it. in fact, we've sent them here in, in some cases, we'll, we'll send a bartender a GoPro and a head strap and a, and a little, you know, mini tripod and like, okay, put the tripod down, make the cocktail, put the head strap on, you know, get the, get the angle, right. Make your cocktail. You got two, two views that you can edit in and out of that make for really engaging content on social and um, it's super easy to do. I mean, re really easy to do. Now, obviously like, there's, there's nuance to editing and, and framing and all that stuff too, but, but to, to, to create content that's interesting and that works well on social, it's available to everybody. And we're excited to try to help bartenders tap into that, whether it's with their phone. You know, we did a, I did a whole shoot with the bartender uh, a few months back that he was doing, he's a, he's an influencer, you know, in this space and a brand hired him to do a video. And I went with him uh, to do it. It was at a golf course. He shot the entire thing in the TikTok, TikTok app, entire video it was just done in the TikTok app down, hit the download button after, and we were done. He added music and the, the thing was shot and ready to post like the same day. Mm. <laughs> he just, he just used his phone. So leaning in on that, um, will help bartenders to, to show off their, their craft a little bit more. And, um, that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things we, we want to help, help the industry do. Cause it, the more that we can see what everyone else has got going on, I think it, it, it gets a creative juices flowing, mm. you know, helps us learn about new places, um, new techniques and, um, makes for a better social experience and going through your feed and just seeing the same thing over and over again. And I mean, a lot of that stuff also you must be sharing, um, on license to still, right? So, cause you're obviously curating content yeah. from other places. How do you, how do you tend to come by that content? Do you have the sort of accounts that you follow and therefore get it organically or do people send stuff to you? I bet, I guess, I guess actually it, a lot of people both. send stuff to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, we get DMS and, and, and tagged and stuff. And then there's, there's some people over the years that just, they know what has done well on our page and what we like. And they will create content, you know, specific, I don't, I don't mm. say specifically for us, but in that style. Yeah. And that, that, that's especially, I think, been the case with the GoPro stuff. Um, because we, our relationship with GoPro, you know, really helped uh, immensely in terms of our content creation and still what our, our main, you know, production, video production guys is someone that worked extensively with GoPro. He's a world-class, you know, GoPro editor amongst other things, but He's got an eye for for GoPro stuff on a different level. And so some of our GoPro stuff are our best stuff, but it's also encouraged some some to go create, you know, kind of a GoPro shoot themselves. Like you said, it's because it's 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 fairly easy to do. And in some cases, they edit that all up, knowing, you know, that's kind of like the style that we like and style that works well on social. And they'll they'll either talk to us beforehand and we can kind of help with some of the details and the arrangements, or they show it to us after. You know, and in some cases, we've actually had them just film raw footage and we've edited the footage, you know. Um, so, yeah, we find it a, a variety of ways. I find it on my Explorer page, like other people find it. I find it, you know, it gets suggested to me through Instagram. It's pages that we follow. And then it's people that directly, I mean, I still see and read every DM that comes in. So if someone like, you know, created some really cool content, they'll send us, go, hey, I think, I think you'll like this. We don't always, you know, their eye might be a little bit different than our eye. You know, we don't always post all that stuff, but we definitely consider it. And if it is going to work well, we use it, you know, and obviously yeah. always throughout this process, when we curate something, giving proper credit so that the focus goes back to the content creator, which I think is really important too. Are there any other tips you've got for sort of creating or making shareable content? Like I'm thinking things around content length use of text, captions even, 
um or, or i mean you can look at it the other way if you like any sort of like don't do this um you know avoid doing that kind of thing um yeah i i think that um i kind of speaking to what we, we were talking about a little bit before was just you know thinking about what's working on the platform as a whole for more mm. of the mainstream con content you know, if it's text overlay or certain now, you know, I know it's YouTube, we get emails saying like, here's the songs that are trending. <laughs> Instagram kind of does that too. And you're picking, doesn't hurt to, you know, like I said, play the game if it, if it works with your content. But um, the other thing I, I, I would say to keep in mind is know the platform and create content as difficult as this may be, create content that works well on that platform. There is some stuff that is definitely shareable, you know, from like, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube Shorts, for example, and maybe you can you know create one piece of content that that works on all three. However, if you're going to do a shoot that's you know shot in, you know, we've done some shoots that are like shot in 8K, but like you're gonna do like a 4K widescreen shoot, probably isn't gonna do well on Instagram. It's just not. Like by the time someone has like you know a, a narrow phone and there's like this wide screen mm. for all the beauty that you think is showing off your bar or whatever you're doing is probably lost, but that may work beautifully for YouTube, right? So create it with that in mind and know that that's you may need to edit it differently to like make it vertical, and that might cut out some of the beauty and some of the you know the extra stuff that you see on the sides of the of the frame, but it'll do better on Instagram. So just know, know where you're, where it's going, what it's posting and, and create content and edit content that fits those platforms. Mm. And knowing your audience as well, I suppose, um, like exactly what it is they want. What I mean, with, with, um, your audience, do you have a sense of what the sort of demographic split is? Like, are they industry professionals? Are they consumers? Are they just random people who occasionally like to look at cocktail stuff? You know, what's, where, where does the audience sit in your, in your mind? And do you even have data on that? Or is it hard yeah. to tell without surveying and that sort yeah. of thing? Well, we used to have a lot more data. <laughs> the <laughs> privacy laws were different. <laughs> but I mean, the, I think the whole, you know, the whole reason that Facebook got that backlash was, I mean, the, the insights that you would get were, just like outrageous you know, in terms yeah. of like who your audience now it's <laughs> much more general mm. you know and for the better of course but i mean it's yeah. much more general in terms of like age and country and we do get you know there's there's some insights that you can pull from but we know that there's uh, quite a bit of industry that follows license and still but obviously there's not 1.1 million you know industry professionals following license and still there's a lot of there's a lot of people that are that are coming in either as enthusiasts or like like we said before that just think that the the whole thing is I mean they look at bartenders like they're rock stars and they just they follow because they think it's cool right so it's definitely a mix I mean how it specifically breaks down is really tough to tell even in Instagram's analytics because you primarily get age location which even that at times can be tough because um, they don't ask for a lot of information when you sign an Instagram, when you sign up for Instagram, it's like, you know, email address and password. Yeah. So you're, you're not filling out it. You're not filling out like a, 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 you know, a data sheet of all your, of all your specifics. So, you know, um, we find just in, in looking at comments and looking at some of the different things and some of the insights that we had prior to the changes, there's a pretty strong, you know, following of, of industry professionals, hmm. but then there's just a lot of people that love, Love the industry. Love the, love the drink. Good cocktails. Cool. What is next then? Two million followers, I guess. Um, would be nice. A million and a half first. <laughs> yeah. Should we take the you ticket know, one step at a time? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, we. Uh, I don't focus too much on on the the number as much as at this point. You know, we, we just we want to continue to make diversify our content and make good content. Um, we don't want people getting bored with our content and that includes us. Sometimes, you know, my wife will be like, what's going on. You need to get out there and do something different. You know, it's just, you know, it, cause you're, we're obviously, you know, you're in the weeds on creating this stuff. And at times you can even get bored. So 
we're we're definitely looking at different ways in the pen and you know what's gone on the last two years has forced us to look at different ways of creating content and we're excited about what's ahead because one of the things that we're we're looking at and and starting to do is is longer form content on platforms like youtube which our videographers love because instead of going hey you know this is going to be this is going to be a fully vertical video and we're in these beautiful bars and they're like we can't even show anything yeah. beyond like what's immediately on the on the side of the bartender. Now, you know, full screen, HD, you know, videos. We're we're rolling out some series on our YouTube channel, and um, you know, I think what I what what I see is that opportunity on the YouTube front is for licensed and still to take that same curated and created content style to YouTube in a way that we're we're gonna create series so we already have started creating series that incorporate bartenders from different parts of the world and experiences from different parts of the world and brands from different parts of the world and kind of becoming the you know the netflix of the booze industry you know you can go on license to distill um and you'll be able to pick different series like if you want to you know learn how to make you know traditional cocktails and have a traditional cocktail video it's there if you want to have ice tutorials that's a different series and that's there yeah you know if you want to go and and see what it's like to visit some of these some of these places more like in a documentary style, that'll be there, and we're excited about doing that. Um, what we've started to reach out to bartenders and and talk to them about what are you passionate about, what are some of the things that you'd like to highlight? Is it different? You know, is it how to make different syrups and stuff at home? Is it visiting certain like you know visiting hidden bars? Is that like a, is that something that a series could be? you know, created three episodes, yeah. six episode series where we can roll some of the stuff out, let the bartender be again, have the spotlight. Yeah. And it could be like, you know, licensed and it still presents hidden bars with Tristan, you know, and, 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 and Tristan takes us through some of his favorite spots, whatever the case would be, but we can go on and allow licensed and still to be the platform to tap into different types of longer form content that are of interest uh, to you. So that's where, we're, that's where we're heading. And that by no means means that we're slowing down on the other content that we're creating and curating. This is just in addition to, because we see an opportunity to um, expand the type of content, the quality of the content and the amount of content that we're producing. Mm. I, I think um, that's one of the great things about YouTube, isn't it? You can use it almost as a sort of, like a TV or like a TV channel, um, like a, a sort of a hosting platform for all of this content. Whereas the sort of more smartphone social media <laughs> platforms like TikTok and Instagram, like you, you've said a couple of times, it's sort of a, a 24, 48 hours. And then although it stays there on yeah. your page, no one really goes back and looks at this stuff, you know? Um, whereas a sort of a bulky YouTube uh, catalog, with all these different shows and and uh, you know <clears throat> themed episodes, will always be there, and people will browse them, and they'll get recommended them, and um, you know they'll go go back and look at them, you know years after they were first aired, and you know perhaps something w that wasn't popular in the first place suddenly has its moment and becomes extremely popular. It's a, it's a great thing about YouTube, I think. Yeah, and that's that's how we view it because we are very very, um, you know, understanding of the fact that, that license to distill me as a, me as a person, anyone else that works with us, we are not the, the star of the show. We have always put the spotlight on the bartenders and we view them as the rock stars. I mean, that's, you know, we're, I'm, st we're still fanboys of this, of this industry. Mm -hmm. And so license has always done that and, and tried to promote the bartender and help the bar the bartender grow their following. And in some cases, I don't, I don't want to say that we created, you know, this, but we've helped. I, I would like to say that we've helped bartenders create another revenue stream by becoming influencers themselves and content creators themselves. But like you said, it's really hard to create meaningful, sustaining, evergreen, you know, content on, on Instagram that can show them in a, in a series format. And so, now that you know that the YouTube audience has grown to the point and it's continuing to grow for us, we thought, what if we take that same formula, but we now look at a more meaningful series-based 
you know, um, stream of content where we can sit down and say, let's create an actual, you know, like mini series with you and let that series stand alone and people can follow along in the episodes and, and subscribe in some cases to that specific series, you know, within our channel. And again, not have it be just, Hey, every series has Jabin or, or anyone else from license still it's not, this is, this is Tristan's passion. Let him be front and center on it. And in some cases, we won't even be there to film it. <laughs> be like, you know, we might help with the editing. We might help, help with the production. We will be helping with, with those things. But it, it, it's going to go beyond where we can be physically and empower the talent, the bartenders who are already talented people to show off their, their content creation skills mm. and what, what they're passionate about, right? And have them be a part of the process so that um, – you know, yes, we are the plat. We're going to hopefully have the community, but it's in no way going to take away the shine from uh, the bartender who has always been, you know, the star of the show in our eyes. Love it. So, I, I mean, great way to finish as well. I love this idea that, you know, you've you've obviously had a great amount of success creating content and curating content, and now you're almost sort of shepherding, fostering, new content creators amongst the bar industry to to help them create their own brands and and um and support them on that journey that's really cool well yeah and, and you know not to not don't, not to go backwards but one of the one of the things that we did this last year that was really cool was you know we did a, a competition for a brand that um after people entered on social the the finalists got an entire gopro shooting kit nice. and they filmed their cocktail themselves and then the winner, um, that the video was edited by our team. So our editing team, you know, looked at angles and how they feature the cocktail and different things. It wasn't just about the cocktail itself or the recipe, like most cocktail competitions are, but it was yeah. how creative they were in the, the shooting process. And so again, like you said, empowering, helping part of that was like, they each got time with us to consult on shooting it. You know, we didn't yeah. even, you know, send them a, a, a camera and say, figure it out. So yeah, we were really able cool. to help. And that, that's something that we want to continue to do is, again, yeah. help bartenders create more content. Fantastic stuff. And uh, on that note, I think we've finished creating this piece of content uh, for today. Jabin, it's been <laughs> an absolute pleasure, man, um, to chat with you. I think we could have gone on a lot longer, but um, maybe we'll do another episode sometime. Yeah, that sounds good. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, Tristan. Uh, Thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. Cool. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. That was good. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. That's good. I think so. I mean, I think we we'd covered a bit of it at the end there and probably about a third of the way through as well. We would, well, we talked about content creation earlier in the episode. I mean, I think it's there, but I don't know. What, Chloe, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, it all overlaps yeah. and, and sometimes, you know, it's not, we're not explicitly asking these questions that are in the um, brief, but they're being answered, you know? Um, so I don't know, Chloe, is there anything from your end? Oh, Ha <laughs> ha.